Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Sakamoto. Today, I would like to talk about regenerative medicine for spinal cord injuries. Spinal cord injuries are currently estimated to affect approximately 150,000 people in Japan. It has been reported that the number of new patients are increasing at about 5,000 people each year. The most common cause of spinal cord injuries is traffic accidents. The other causes can be due to falls from a great height or sports-related injuries. Before we talk about spinal cord injuries, I'd like to talk about the structure of the spinal cord. The spinal cord is a nerve that extends from the brain to the lower part of the back. The place it passes through is a nerve that goes through a tunnel-like structure called the spinal canal at the back of the spine. First of all, let me explain what the spinal cord is. It is divided into cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral regions, with 7 cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, 5 lumbar vertebrae, and the sacrum. Many nerves branch out from the spinal cord and pass through it to various parts of the body. This means that by tracing back in reverse to identify which part of the body has become immobile or damaged, you can determine the location of the spinal cord injury. A spinal cord injury becomes more severe as the damage occurs higher up. For example, if you injure the third bone from the top of your neck, you will not be able to breathe on your own. As a result, you'll need to use a breathing apparatus to live. If the damage is at or below C4, the muscles needed for breathing, called the diaphragm, are still functioning, so you can breathe on your own. This shows that various symptoms can occur depending on the location of the spinal cord injury. Spinal cord injuries come in two types, incomplete paralysis and complete paralysis. First, the complete paralysis. It means the spinal cord injury is severe, and the limbs don't move at all. Incomplete paralysis refers to cases where only sensory nerves remain or when only a part of motor function or sensation is retained. In incomplete paralysis, various symptoms can be seen. Next, as for complications of spinal cord injuries, the first one is respiratory impairment. When the upper part of the neck spine, from C1 to C3 as mentioned earlier, is damaged, the muscles used for breathing become paralyzed and the person may need to rely on a breathing apparatus for daily life. The second is complications of cardiovascular disorders. For example, bradycardia, which is a slow heartbeat, and orthostatic hypotension, where you have low blood pressure when you stand up. In addition, people with spinal cord injuries often spend a lot of time in the same position, leading to economy syndrome. This increases the risk of very scary complications such as blood clots forming in the body's blood vessels, which can lead to pulmonary embolism if they reach the lungs, stroke if they reach the brain, or heart attack if they reach the heart. The third is digestive complications. This involves conditions like gastric ulcers or duodenal ulcers, where holes can form in the stomach or intestines due to stress during the acute phase of injury. Generally, when gastric ulcers or duodenal ulcers occur, there is often significant abdominal pain. However, in some cases, people may not realize the internal pain until it's too late, and they may need surgery due to bleeding in the stomach or intestines. The fourth is complications related to urology. This means that when a spinal cord injury occurs, urinal problems such as not being able to urinate or not feeling the urge to urinate can occur. Sometimes, harmful bacteria can enter the urine, spreading throughout the body and leading to a serious condition called sepsis. Sepsis often leads to loss of life. The fifth one is pressure sores. Pressure sores are also commonly referred to as bed sores. When someone has a spinal cord injury, spending a long time in a wheelchair or lying in the same position for an extended period can lead to the development of pressure sores, for example, on the heels or the coccyx, tailbone area. This is called pressure ulcers, which occur when constant pressure is applied to the same area, causing poor blood circulation in the skin and leading to tissue decay and necrosis. 
This pressure sore too can become sepsis if bacteria enter from there, and it is not uncommon for bacteria to enter the bloodstream and cause a loss of life, as I mentioned earlier. The only way to prevent this is to frequently change your body position. As for the treatment, within the current insurance healthcare options, if, for example, there is a case where spinal bones are fractured due to a traffic accident and bone fragments are stuck in the spinal cord, or if those bones are compressing the spinal cord, immediate surgery will be performed. Afterward, the compressed nerves are released, but there is individual variation in whether the nerves return to normal and if sensation in the limbs comes back. If there is paralysis or loss of sensation in the arms and legs due to spinal cord injury, muscle training and rehabilitation will be carried out afterward. However, even with rehabilitation, the paralysis and sensory loss in the limbs can occur as a consequence of spinal cord injury. Therefore, regenerative medicine using stem cells for spinal cord injuries has been gaining attention recently. To do this, you take stem cells from your own body first. In Japan, there are two types of regenerative medicine for spinal cord injuries, one from bone marrow and the other from fat. Stem cells obtained from bone marrow are said to be easily differentiable into nerves. However, there are two major disadvantages. The first thing is that stem cells from the bone marrow cannot be cultured in large numbers. Culturing stem cells from bone marrow is very challenging. In the case of fat cells, generally, we can increase the number to between 100 million and 150 million cells. But when it comes to bone marrow, you can't culture as many cells to that extent. The second is that when taking stem cells from the bone marrow, a needle is used to make a hole in the pelvis to collect the stem cells. If bacteria enter during this process, it can lead to bone marrow inflammation or sepsis, posing a threat to one's life. In this regard, fat-derived stem cells can be easily extracted and do not pose a significant risk. In Japan, stem cell infusions are divided into two types, those using fat-derived stem cells and those using bone marrow-derived stem cells. And another thing, a new treatment method for spinal cord injury regeneration has been approved. It involves delivering stem cells directly to the damaged area of the spinal cord. The spinal cord is located within the dura mater. This method involves delivering stem cells derived from fat directly into the dura mater. This is expected to be more effective than intravenous delivery because it directly delivers stem cells to the site of spinal cord injury. One of the distinctive features of our spinal cord injury regenerative therapy at our clinic is the cultivation of stem cells from fat, which are first administered through intravenous drips. And simultaneously, we also perform intradural injections of these fat-derived stem cells directly into the damaged area of the spinal cord. We are using a treatment method that enhances the therapeutic effect further by simultaneously administering intravenous drip and intrathecal injection. Today, I talked about spinal cord injuries and regenerative medicine for spinal cord injuries. Thank you very much.